the season 2020 with this episode on decision making with the um, noisy observation. So instead of a specific result, I have decided to rather present a, a wide glance to, to my research here at INRIAM and put some references to the main results. So if you want to know the details, we can do that here in my office. You can pass any time. Door is always open. All right. So I want to start putting uh, at the center the, the main mathematical object that we use in, 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 in our research, which is that of um, noisy observations. So given two random variables, x and y, right, with this uh, joint distribution pxy, we can admit that y is a noisy observation of x when the observation takes place through an observation channel described by this conditional probability distribution py given x. So essentially, for every possible input of the channel, we have a random variable whose distribution is py given x equal little x, right? So essentially, it is a random variable whose probability distribution is parametrized by the input of the channel, right? So this is the big picture of, of what we understand by um, noisy observations, right? And this is what is going to be at the center of, uh, of this talk. During the last uh, two years, we excel in this practice of testing for viruses. And this is a good example of, as in, of a noisy observation. So essentially, given our biological samples, we want to identify our, our health state, right? Infected or not infected of the virus. And then um, with a given probability, with this probability exactly, we, uh, under the assumption that we are infected, we are going to get a signal of infection uh, uh, with this probability, right? But it may happen also that um, we observe a non-infection signal, right, when we are actually uh, infected. So this brings us to the big discussions we had about false positives and false negatives. The key point is that based on those uh, observations of these tests that we used to buy uh, in the pharmacy, we have to take decisions on whether uh, wearing a mask, uh, observing isolation, taking uh, common tra transportation, etc. Right. So, with a few uh, colleagues here at the Neo, we contributed to the analysis of this decision making using um, uh, game theory. So, here is the reference for for the, those results. Right. And on a more larger um, scale, right, given number of tests, um, we can also take some other decision making, such as, uh, for instance, resource allocation between hospitals. And for that, the key point is identifying the actual number of uh, infected individuals in a population. So those are the kind of, um, of, uh, of problems that may arise in, in, in decision making with um, uh, noise observations. No more details are needed because we are, we are, we are very good at, um, at testing for viruses now. Let us put now um, data transmission right, as an example of decision making um, uh, with noise observations. All right. So let's start with this example, which is uh, one in which one um, uh, telephone is communicating with a given receiver, for instance, a Wi-Fi access point, right? This can be our phone and our own access point, and this can be our neighbor's phone and his, um, um, his or her um, uh, Wi-Fi access point, right? And the key point is that uh, uh, both telephones are subject to mutual interference. So that... Um, apparently complicated scenario can be also modeled through um, this very simple idea of noise observations. Essentially, we have two outputs, Y1 and Y2, that depend on both uh, inputs of, of, of the channel. So the, the key questions uh, here are of the form how many bits per second can be simultaneously and reliably uh, transmitted. So this calls for uh, information rates. So essentially the amount of information per time unit that can be that can be transmitted, right? And for advancing in, in answering these kind of questions, we do assumptions, of course. And we assume, for instance, that the outputs are simply uh, weighted sums of the inputs of the channel plus um, a given noise, right? As, an, as, a, as innocent uh, and easy that may example may appear, this uh, canonical model, which is called um, the Gaussian interference channel is, is, a, is, a, is an open problem in information theory. Essentially, we don't know exactly what is the, the, the pairs of information rates that can be simultaneously and reliably uh, achieved, right? So for, for giving a, an answer to that question, we need to provide essentially two things. The first one is um, a proof of existence of a method, right, that allows us to reach these two 
um, information rates, right? So for, for, for each pair R1, R2, we need to say there is this method that allows uh, achieving this, this pair, right? And the set of pairs for which always there exists a method is a, a, a pair of achievable rates. There is also the second part of the answer, which is the set of impossible rates. And then we say uh, technology can advance as much as we want, and this set of rates are never going to be um, achievable. Right? So with these two regions, one that is called the achievable region and the other one, the converse region or the impossibility region, we describe the fundamental limits of this, uh, of this channel. We have contributed to this. Here is the reference uh, uh, for that. Right? And the key point here is that um, we have to combat the fact that we have noisy um, observations. And how to combat the, the existence of, of this um, um, noisy channel. Well, there is this theory introduced by Claude Shannon in 1948, in which uh, he explained us how to do that. So let's go into the details and let us introduce this idea of a code. All right. So imagine that we have an information source and a destination. So we want to send information from the source to the destination, right? And for that, we install a transmitter and a receiver, right? Um, and this is the channel. These are the noisy observations that you have. So essentially, the, the, the output of the transmitter is subject to uh, noise, and this is what the receiver uh, gets at the end. Okay, so how it works, very simple. We assume that the, that the, the information source right, can output um, M different uh, symbols, right? And for each symbol, we are going to build a vector or a code word, right? Of, of n symbols that we are going to put into the channel. At the output of the channel, we get, as we saw, a random variable that is equal to the input plus um, this uh, noise, which is also a random variable, in this case, a Gaussian um, uh, random variable. And based on, on, on an observation of this random variable, we want to solve an MRI hypothesis test, right? We want to know whether the random variable y follows the distribution given here with i equal one, two, or m, right? And then the, the index i that we choose is going to be the estimation of the symbol that has been transmitted, right? So this is essentially the idea of coding. So if we go back to the definition, right, we have, we have uh, m different code words, right, from, from one to m, and the, 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 all the possible outputs of this channel are going to be divided into M sets, right? So D1, D2, up to the M, right? And when the realization of this random variable falls in one of these uh, sets, which are disjoint, we are going to assume that, for instance, when Y belongs to D2, the message that was transmitted was message two, all right? So this is, this is the way we construct codes, and this is the, essentially the way we combat um, noisy observations. Right, so there, there is essentially um, a construction of a code that is uh, that is there in the middle. All right, for a long time, coding has been implemented for exclusively uh, transmitting information. This has been um, since the since the early fifties. Uh, the the main idea in, in communication theory. We have um, um, advocated for the fact that coding can be uh, also implemented for simultaneously transmitting information and energy. For instance, in that case, what we have is that one of the outputs of the channel instead of being used for information uh, decoding let's say is used for recharging a given battery and then the key question there is the information rates and energy rates that can that can be simultaneously and reliably um, achieved all right so very nice so we know how to combat now um, noisy observations the key point is now to, to know whether uh, this noise observations may act to our advantage. And to answer that, um, essentially, uh, let's try to put it in other words, which is what can we hide within the noise um, that implies this noisy uh, observation? So for that, I'm going to show a very, very simple example. All right, so we have um, um, an information source here that is common to these two receivers, one and two. So we want to transmit information from this common source to these two receivers, right? We use this transmitter that has an encoder 
two that builds the code words that we saw before, right? And put them through the channel. So receiver one sees the output Y1 and receiver two sees the, the output Y2. It appears here that receiver two uh, sees through two channels. So this, we say that receiver two is degraded. So it's a degraded channel. Uh, it's, it's a noisier channel than um, receiver one. And we are going to use the fact that receiver two has a noisier channel to try to do something extremely interesting is yeah, that, that we can summarize as follows. Okay, we are going to try to modify the, the code words such that a private message can be transmitted, right? And we want receiver two to remain unaware of the fact that we are modifying this, this code. Okay, and the answer is, is, is of the form, um, a non-negligible um, non rate can be achieved, right? That is, uh, I mean, that is scaled with the square root of n, n being the length of, of, of this vector, and the probability that receiver 2 realizes that we have done this modification um, uh, can be arbitrarily small. Okay, so long story short, what I have just shown is that codes can be altered to, to stealthily transmit an additional message. And the key word here is stealthily, because receiver 2 that does not decode the private message is unaware or is incapable of detecting that we are using encoder one instead of encoder two. And this is, and this is key for um, um, identifying something more general, which is that data can be altered to stealthily tamper with decision-making processes. And this is probably the main takeaway of this, um, of this presentation, because who says decision-making processes says also cyber physical systems um, so we have studied this problem particularly for the case of um, of power systems and who says cyber physical systems says also of course um, machine learning and this is something that um, that is occupying us uh, more recently all right so let's let's go into the details so what is uh, exactly what is going on here we have a, a physical system right that provides us with data set Z, right, that we observe through this uh, uh, data acquisition system, and we obtain this random variable Y, all right? This random variable Y um, uh, is observed, and we want to make a decision, meaning we want to choose a theta such that this uh, random variable here, the function U of theta and the random variable Y, um, uh, satisfy some conditions in expectation or in probability. The key point is that that decision making is made, right, seeing the random variable y as distributed following this distribution, all right? But what is actually happening is that there is um, uh, this uh, data injection that occurs here, and actually this random variable follows a different distribution that depends on this modification that has been applied to the data, all right? So it means essentially that we are capable of introducing a distortion on the system. So this is essentially the expectation with respect to the distribution without the data injection, right? And this is the um, expectation with the, the attack. So this is certainly different from zero, right? And the capacity or, or the ability of an observer to determine whether this uh, uh, injection here exists or not depends on this relative entropy, okay? so. Um, the, the, the problems that we are interested in more recently are those of the form in which the decision maker has to maximize a given function of this form that depends on this uh, A, right? And uh, the, the another entity, let's say a malicious entity, has to uh, um, take a, an A that minimizes the whole expression, which is the, the decision making process plus uh, something that has to do with the ability of someone being able to determine whether or not there is this injection here. All right. So this is this is in general terms essentially what uh, what I have been um, um, working in, in uh, at INRIA. Part of this work uh, has been summarized in this uh, in this book co-edited with my colleagues uh, uh, Ali Tadjert and Dean Spoor. Uh, if you want a free copy, pass by by my by my office and and you can get one. And uh, with this, I want to end and, and thank you very much for, for, for your attention.
I'm open. Thank you.